Um, so we decided to do a live Q&A this afternoon, completely unannounced. That's all right. And uh, we're going to call people live. So we have used to do this in the past um, somewhat regularly, every couple of months. And it was always, every time we did it, I was like, oh my gosh, we have to do this more often because it was always ended up being at least a couple, but um, usually a ton of great conversations um, when we just call people uh, live and let them know what was going on. And um, not let them know what was going on, I just said that as I was not paying attention, looking down at my phone to see my wife was calling me. Um, let me take this real quick, actually. Hello. Yeah, I think it'd be, I mean, if you want to use the other ones. I mean, I've got enough to hold them all right now. I mean, it's just that it takes up that whole top of the closet. Yeah, so we used to do these, we used to call them live rounds, the no hooks, back when we used to refer to ourselves um, more exclusively as no hook media, which we kind of still refer to ourselves as that, which was born out of the uh, jab, 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 right hook uh, from Gary Vee. But the live rounds with no hook was live Q&A where we'd have people jump on, and we would call them, and uh, I mean, we had people from Lebanon, Nigeria, a um, couple, couple places in Europe, um, all, all over the place and all over the U.S. too, um, that we would call and had some great questions and it was just always super impactful. So I just wanted to do that this afternoon and I figured we'd film kind of a behind the scenes look at uh, what kind of goes into that of randomly deciding we're going to do that and then trying to throw it all together and uh, see if we can't pull this off. We got an hour. So we got plenty of time and we'll uh, hopefully, you know, provide some real value for some people that have questions and uh, be able to answer them and have a deeper conversation than, than can be had in just a replied DM or just a, you know, replied comment uh, on a post. So people that have real questions, um, real concerns, real things going on, um, we'd like to be able to provide as much value as we can to those people during that time. So uh, we will try to do the best we can, see what happens. And uh, it may be an epic failure. Just kidding, it's not gonna be an epic failure. It's gonna be incredible. So stay tuned. question is how do you create a culture of practice that creates a what lifetime, lifetime of success. a lifetime of success um, you know creating a culture of practice is very very simple it's by practicing I'm just kidding that's not the only answer so you know, with us, we have a huge culture of practice and that's for us with role playing. And so all of our different scripts, all of our different scenarios that our coordinators uh, are faced with out in the field, we role play all these things. We actually have a boot camp coming up this Friday uh, with all uh, with all of our newest coordinators uh, coming into town here in Greenville, South Carolina. And the primary function of that boot camp is role play. Uh, we're going to role play tons of different scenarios over and over and over until it becomes you know, second nature. Because until it becomes second nature, until these scripts become, you know, unconscious or subconscious, you know, to where you don't even have to think about it, I guess that would be unconscious, where you don't have to think about it, it just comes out of your mouth when you open it, then is when, then and only then, is when you can practice and really hone in on those soft skills, those, you know, dramatic pauses and the passion points, being able to make eye contact with different people in the room, until you have these scripts and your process is down, um, you know, at a very, very, very high, at a very, very, very high level, you're not going to be able to, um, you know, operate at the level that you want to operate. And so, you know, being a culture of practice for us means role play. Uh, but for whatever it is that you do, I mean, a culture of practice just comes from day in and day out, the consistency of doing the basics, the consistency of sticking to the basics and, you know, doing the things that you know 
are what got you there. And on, only those things that got you there will get you to the next level and then sticking to those basics. We talk about that all the time, um, but that's what ultimately creates that culture of practice. And it has to be created from the top down. Like the leadership has to be as all in on practicing the craft as the person that's brand new. Um, you know, that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about this new role uh, in my career where I'm you know, going out and training our new coordinators in the field. I'll be headed to Michigan tonight uh, to train one of our new agents. I was in Kansas last week. I was in Kentucky two weeks before that, and Maryland the week before that, training our new coordinators because I have to practice to make sure that I'm operating and performing at the highest level so that I can then teach them and show them how it's done. Um, so a culture of practice is best created from the top down, and it's only done through consistency uh, over time. Oh, Mark just gave us his number. We're going to call him next. Mark, I hope you have a great question because we have been highly anticipating getting on somebody on the phone here. Uh, Eric Gibbs, how do you break down your daily time, families, hobbies, and work? It completely depends on what's going on. I think this question is actually really, really important because a lot of people – have that question and a lot of people are struggling in that area of how do they break that down but the reality is you can never break it down into a into a structure that will sustain effectively long term because things change things change week to week month to month but things change day to day something that's a priority right now may not be a priority next week something that's a priority right now may not be a priority in six hours from now. And so, you know, I loved when Erwin McManus, when I had him on my podcast, um, and I love Erwin McManus, everything that he does. Um, I love the way he talked about it because he talked about this idea of balance. And that if you think about balance, this is exactly what he said. He said, if you think about balance less as an equality and more as a asymmetrical symmetry, as in the earth is in balance with the sun, the earth and the sun aren't the same size. They're not equal, but they're balanced, right? And only when they're in balance is what makes everything work. And so as all the planets in the solar system are all different sizes, distances, all of that, but they are balanced in such a way that everything works, so too are the areas of your life in which requires the greater or the greatest gravitational pull in that moment or in that day, or in that week, or in that month. And so there are times when you're going to need to, you know, spend more time at work. There are going to be times where you need to spend more time at home. But I do not think that is something that can be a structure that is set in stone and that can be abided by as though it's some type of time blocking schedule. Because things happen, things change, priorities change, um, you know, you have to be able to go with the flow. So I think of less of balance and more of harmony in this, this like natural, like ebb and flow, because the reality is the second you realize and the importance, the importance is self-awareness and being able to be aware of the imbalances. But the second that you realize there's an imbalance in one area. So the second you realize that you need to spend more time at home and then you adjust accordingly. So you start spending more time home at home. By doing so, you are going to create an imbalance in one of the other areas. So the second you say, oh, crap, I need to start spending more time at home. The second you start spending more time at home, you're going to start spending less time somewhere, whether that's at work or whether that's at the gym or whether that's you know, whatever that may be. And so it's about constantly ebbing and flowing, constantly being aware of an imbalance and then adjusting accordingly, being aware of an imbalance and adjusting accordingly. And so it kind of creates this what I would look at is like a, you know, like a harmony. Hey, Mark. What's up, Mark? What's going on? Oh, you know, just trying to uh, provide some value on this uh, live Q and A. <laughs> there we go, there we go. How are you, man? Yeah, uh, I'm doing amazing, I'm doing amazing. How Good. Yourself? I've been doing, been doing well. I've been liking your videos that you've been putting out, by the way. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate that. Yes, sir. Kind of following your footsteps a little bit. Yeah, man, what questions do you have? So here's the thing. Uh, so I run an auto dealership. I'm looking at a, I, I manage it and I've uh, gotten to a position where I can uh, buy out the owners and everything else. It'll be mine um, here within the next two years on the original goal. 
Um, but they just accelerated on me, so I now have the opportunity to buy it out at the end of the year. So my wow. question is, I can wait longer if I wanted to. They're willing to work with me. Should I wait longer? I don't think I'm in a position to actually do it yet. Um, or should I try to bring an investor on? You know, I know it's kind of a little bit outside the insurance realm, but you as you know, you just recently kind of obviously kind of into, yeah. took into a position where now you're in ownership in your position. So I thought it'd be a great question to kind of tie. Do I try to bring someone else in for the time being since I don't have the clout really to, you know, stroke the check for the cars and things like that yet? Or do I kind of hold off until I am fully ready to do it on my own? That's a, it's a, it's a really good question because, you know, here's the kind of things that I, I that my thought process that, that I go through. Um, you know, with what you just said, my instant thought was, well, why, well, you know, what's the rush if they'll wait? But then, you know, I started thinking, well, you know, the, the best time to buy is when something is available <laughs> and you never know what in the world could happen over the next year and a half. Right. Um, right. And so I don't so much agree that an investor is is the you know would be the right move but someone that would just finance you know some that you could you know you know get a promissory note through for the remaining you know capital that you need you know to to be able to make that transaction happen where you pay them back you know over a certain period of time at a certain interest rate i don't know that i would want to just bring in an outside investor that wasn't involved in the business just so that i could buy it now but right. if, but if you had someone that you know had the capital available that you know it could sit in the bank for one percent or you know you could you know, it could do a loan with you for obviously more than that um, you know something like that would be interesting but you know, I don't know that I would really be willing to give away equity to someone that's not a part of the business you know what I mean right yeah and that's I'm, what I was struggling not so with big well. on silent partners right. So, I mean, that's what I would look at is, you know, see if you could find, if you know, if you could find someone that could just put up the money just as a loan or like as a, you know, just to, that you could have a, a note with, um, that would be, you know, ideal. Um, or if you could get the, uh, the current owners to, to put something in writing that they will agree to sell it to you and go ahead and put in the price. And I would probably try to get that worded as a maximum price. You know, some some type of verbiage that that states that this would be the like, uh, you know, the lawyerese kind of verbiage that somehow states that this would be the the acquisition costs, but it would it would phrase it in a way that that would be the maximum you would pay. Because you never know, right. the absolute economy could crash eight months from now. And you don't want to all of a sudden have a document that you've signed that you're going to purchase it for some value that now it's not worth. Right. You know yeah, what I mean? um, but you'd want to capitalize on the fact that, you know, if, if the business is growing like crazy and the business is now actually worth more than that, if you can go ahead and get them to lock into a price, that's great. So a lot of that comes down to your trust in those guys and and that but that's awesome man congratulations yeah thank you i appreciate it so like, like so this is something that just kind of came in uh came out about within the last two weeks and uh, yeah so yeah just trying to follow my mind around and just so you know like kind of direction was, and just so you know for me like to you know be transparent that's you know that's what i did i i took out a note um because i had the opportunity to invest in our company and it happened really fast it was like a the opportunity came up on Friday and they needed to know by Monday <laughs> uh, for various reasons. And um, so I just had to do a note um, and I'm paying that back monthly. Um, right. So that's, you know, that's how, that's how I did it. But um, you know, not to say that that makes the most sense for you, but I just, I'm really wary of having anybody that owns part of like, at that point, that'll be your business and someone that owns your, you know, part of your business, but has zero vested, other than wanting to get their money back, you know, I don't know. It just seems, yeah. it just always makes me feel a little, a little weird. But, yeah, no, I wouldn't want somebody to be a partner so much as the investing, I guess, was just like, kind of like you said, just somebody to invest in me more than the business and, yeah. uh, and then get a percentage back, I guess, of, you know, or not a percentage back, but, you know, just a, I guess, interest rate, you know? So yeah. Interest, so, yeah, yeah no, for I sure. appreciate that. I mean, it's very insight and kind of where I was getting towards the thing as well. Yeah. And, uh, yeah very good. Opportunity. Awesome, man. Hey, where are you located again? I'm in uh, Des Moines, Iowa. Ah, Des Moines, Iowa. That's awesome. 
Very good, man. Well, I appreciate you uh, jumping on here. Thanks, boss. I appreciate you. All right, man. Have a good day. See you, bud. You too, brother. Uh, Joe Salmon on Facebook said, what's your next big challenge for yourself? I know you had the crazy long run, which was very impressive. Uh, I am still recovering from that run. Let me tell you, if I can show you guys like up close my left foot right now, you would throw up more than likely. Uh, my big toe finally came off uh, about three nights ago. Uh, my big toenail, yes. My, <laughs> my, big toe, my big toe did not fall off, but my big toenail did fall off and it is disgusting uh yeah it's really gross so my big toenail on my left foot is off the toenail next to that's off and the toenail next to that is off and black and just nasty um but i think i can run um still so that's, that's cool um but yeah i do want to do a 50 miler i think that's going to be next and then um go straight from the 50 to what's 100k it's 100 kilometers 60 something miles I'm not good with my conversions. Sometimes I can't remember which one's longer. Dan Smith, what part of Michigan? I'm flying into Flint. 62.13. 62.13. So yeah, they'll try to do like 100K. Then I want to. I want to do 100 miles by the end of next year. I want to do a 100 mile race by the end of next year. That's the goal. I got a ways to go. I say I've got a ways to go, but I did. Um, you know. Well, yeah, I got a ways to go. <laughs> I was going to try to somehow somehow go back on that. But like, ah, oh, it's not that. Yeah, it's a really big deal. It's nowhere close to a 50K. But we'll make it happen. Thanks for, uh, thanks for asking. How do you handle change in upper management when they start handling change uh, immediately? Um, that's a difficult one. But I think you got to get to know them on a personal level somehow. And again, I don't know what your position is versus they, where they are and the hierarchy. Um, but getting to know them and getting to know their intent, getting to know their background and experience, that you can start to have some context and some frame of references when these decisions start being handed down. Um, that can be a very frustrating position, certainly, certainly. Um, can be frustrating, can be overwhelming. It can be, you know, any type of uncertainty like that creates fear and anxiety. So, you know, just being able to get to know more about them and get to know them better, I think will help tremendously. And when a decision comes across, knowing like where, you know, where's that decision coming from? Like what, what's behind that decision that was just uh, made, I think will uh, add tremendous amount of um, assurance or reassurance um, to the anxiety that can ca be caused by that. It's a great, it's a really good question. How can you get more pleasure and less pain in 2019? Um, so the, you know, <laughs> that's a funny comment on Facebook, Mark. Um, so the quote that you know we say more than anyone here, and you know maybe, maybe the only one that say it here, um, if you seek discomfort, the world will deliver you pleasure. If you seek comfort, the world will deliver you pain. So you know if you want to experience more pain, then just try to be as comfortable as possible, and just get ready because it's coming. Um, but you know if you want to be rewarded in life, if you want to you know, level up in life. And if you want to experience all the great things that life has to offer, you're going to have to go through some discomfort and you're going to have to purposely seek out some of that discomfort so that you can experience it. And uh, we try to do that every single day in different ways. So, Hello. Hey, this is Tyler Harris. Hey, how are you doing, man? I'm good, man. Who is this? My name is Nuncio. Nuncio? Yes, sir. Awesome, man. Where are you calling from or where are we calling you? Well, you're, you're calling me from the Inland Empire of Montana, California. Mon Montana, California? Montana. Yes, sir. Awesome. Very good. Well, what do you do? Um, I'm a freelance uh, photographer, videographer, nice. graphic designer, printer, full-on one-man media guy. Awesome. Love uh, it. You will. Love it. So what, what, was, the, uh, what was your question? Um, actually, I, I, I just – my business has grown. Let, you know, graciously, I have yeah. grown, um, and I've I've gotten I'll get some real numbers out here. You know, um, so I'm not trying to put it out there, but I'm going to do it anyway. Sure. Um, I, I'm I'm averaging about six k 
uh, month. Um, I recent, recently, my fiance um, joined on board with the business. She's helping me out with administration and bookkeeping and, and everything. She's actually also getting a little bit into the um, into the business as well, as far as photography, videography is concerned. Um, so right now, I guess my question to you is, the money that we have, you know, grown, and we have debt from, you know, previous experiences and failures in business as mm -hmm. well, um, over the last couple of years, um, we're trying to grow this, uh, we're trying to take care of debt. Uh, what's the biggest, what's the biggest advice you can give, give, you know, give to a young couple, I guess, in business? Man, first of all, congrats. That's awesome. That is awesome. Thank you. Um, you know, I think the, the fact that that's the question that you have is a really, really good, good thing um, because it means you're being smart about it and you're being calculated with it. And, you know, the majority of people out there, they, um, you know, ha start having some success. So it's just all about like, you know, what can I get? You know, how can we enhance our lifestyle? And you're, you know, being way more, you're just being, you know, smart with it, um, which is awesome. I'm trying to be mature. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is not easy. Um, certainly. Um, right. So, you know, as far as the debt, what type of debt are you talking about? You talking about like mortgage? You talking about like credit card debt? No, I mean we're not, we're not, we're not successful enough to have a mortgage. Mortgage. Okay. <laughs> we we have we have uh, credit card debt. Okay. Previous loans that we've had, or probably about anywhere anywhere from like ten ten k into debt. Okay. Yeah. So I mean. Uh, yeah, the t the typical kind of Dave Ramsey method for that type of debt elimination. I mean, it is legit. Um, so just looking at like which of those debts that you have are at the highest interest rates and knocking mm -hmm. those out first. But mm -hmm. I think when you're at the scale that you're at with your business, that you need to make sure that you're taking some of that money and reinvesting it into your business so that you can continue to grow while you're you know paying down your debt as well. Um, I, I agree. Uh, I've been between, you know, investing in new equipment, um, like new computers or, or yeah. things like that. I guess my, my significant other is more uh, conservative than I am. I'm a bit sure. more ambitious. Yeah. You know, one thing that I've just, um, you know, I've observed, you know, from afar, it seems, you know, with photography and videography, I mean, geez, it seems like every month you could find a new camera or lens or computer or software or, Very true. you know, Very something. True. Um, well, I'm getting by with just what I have. Yeah. One camera and one lens. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, for sure. Um, so I think there's a balance there, you know, right. And, and quite frankly, you know, being in business with your spouse is not easy either. And so that, that adds a whole right. other element to it. And so, you know, you got to be thoughtful about those things and making sure that both people are on the same page. Um, but I think there's a happy median in there. I think it's, hey, it's just, it's communicating and putting a plan together. That's going to make everything, you know, way better with her. And having a plan is going to make you stick to it. And so it's figuring out, okay, hey, here's what we're going to put away each month, you know, towards these debts. This is the first debt that we're going to knock out. And this is the next one that mm -hmm. we're going to knock out. And then here's the things that I think that we should invest, you know, in to, that will grow our business. And, mm -hmm. you know, not just looking at, you know, equipment that we can invest in to have higher quality, you know, work, but, you know, different things as far as marketing strategies and Facebook ads and, you know, different types mm -hmm. of things that you can do to get more business. Um, right. That's the way right now I would be looking at any investment into your business is, you know, is, is this investment going to bring me more business than it costs me to, you know, purchase or cost me to invest in? Um, right. Because quite frankly, you right. know, a new camera, that may not bring in any more business. It may make the business look better to you, but yeah. you know, it may not bring in anything else that's walking through the door or, or calling you or sending you a message, you know, for, for you to come, you know, work. Um, but taking that exact same money and pouring that into, you know, Instagram story ads or, you know, LinkedIn ads or, you know, whatever that may be, um, you know, is, is ultimately at the end of the day to get a, you know, bring your, bring new business in. Um, right. 
So I think it's I think it's doing a combination of both. I certainly don't think you need to ab abandon the debt, but I also am not the kind of person that's scared of having little debt. So I don't think the first thing you need to do is pay it all off. However, if my wife wanted to pay it all off and she was going to be extremely uncomfortable until it was all paid off, I would figure out a way to do that. <laughs> you know, I mean, so she's right, right. so I mean, if she's extremely against having any of that debt or having that debt causes her anxiety and having that debt causes her to, you know, yeah feel a certain way. I, I don't want to be afraid afraid of it. You know? yeah. I don't want to be afraid of my art debt, you know. But I understand where she's coming from. Yeah. And that's you know, I guess that's that's just the way the cookies crumbles. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, and it's figuring out, you know, what can we do? What what can we do extra? I'm really big on I had a cool conversation the other day with a guy, Ted Faden, who I do this modern man show with. Um and he had made an investment. We were talking about it and I'm really big on um you know, finding additional ways to bring in income and then using that income for the more risky investments because it's kind of like found right. money. So if like you sat down with her and you said, oh, hey, we're going to we're going to pay off this amount of month for debt, uh, this amount of month yeah. uh, towards debt. But I'm going to mm -hmm. pick up this over here, extra income, and we're going to use the extra income that I'm going to go create to put towards this, that extra income is kind of like found money, right? And yeah. uh, it's kind of like, you yeah. know, like a gambling um, uh, analogy. It's like you're playing with house money at that time, you know? Right. Um, exactly. Which I feel way more comfortable with, with riskier investments with house money than I would with my money, uh, even though it's still your money, you know? So I think, I think communication is key. Um, you know, running a business with a spouse is difficult to begin with. So, you know, the communication to me, it's way more important to go home each night with a spouse that's in a really good place because of where your debt's at, than yeah. be progressing your business a little bit faster and still having the debt and your wife be, you know, in a place where she's anxious. Right. Right. Yeah. So, I, I agree. Yeah, I agree for sure. Cool. All right, man. Well, we appreciate yeah. you uh, you having the question you. and uh, you. and jumping on, man. Have really, a good rest of your really day. quick. Uh, yeah, I yeah. Want to take your time. Anyway, um, I I don't know. Uh, you've been on um, Chase Tuning's Ever Four Radio podcast. Yeah. I, I he's actually one of my clients. Awesome, dude. Chase is awesome, man. He's a great guy. That happened. Chase is a good guy. Right? That happened so right. randomly and last minute. I was like flying to California <laughs> to do another, a different podcast, and I just put a post out there that said something like, "Hey, I'm headed to California. Who do you know that I should try to link up with?" And somebody tagged him and yeah. said, "Hey, you should have Chase Tuning on." It may have been you, <laughs> but um, they said like, "Hey, you should you should meet up with Chase Tuning," and I happened to be like twenty minutes from his house. And so I just, yeah. you know, literally like that next afternoon, we came over to his house and filmed and I've been, you know, I talked to him, you know, here and there ever since. He's a great guy. Really great guy. It's California. You never know where you're going to find. That's it, man. That is it. And coincidentally, if you ever talk to him again, say he's the reason that I missed my podcast interview with him. My life. Okay. Because I was, I was supposed then. to, I was supposed to do a podcast with him. My life right after the one with him, yeah. but somehow the, the, our calendar got mixed up and I just got messed up on the time. And I was supposed to be at Ed Milet's house when I was at Chase's house. And right. Ed Milet saw on my Instagram stories that I was at Chase's house and not his. And I was like an hour late. And so he just left and I uh, didn't get to do the podcast. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a little, little sore, little it sore subjects, but it happened for a reason for sure. <laughs> right, right, right. All right, man. Thank appreciate you. Thank you, you for everything. I yeah, really man. Appreciate it. All the advice. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Have and a good day. Mind if I send you an email? Of course. Some things to you. Of course. Cool. Definitely. Yeah, man. Thank you. Bro. All right. Have a good day. Okay. See you, man. Hello. Hey, what's up, man? This is Tyler Harris. Hey, what's up, man? Is this How's Casey? Yeah, just put my number to give you a quick uh, question insight on what I was actually typing there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, what's going on? Yeah, so I saw you built most of your success <coughs> from life insurance sales. Is that correct? Yep, that's it. Sweet. So that's a you know intangible product in a sense, right? Uh, I was yeah. mentioning to you, I... I well, I'm sure I've been doing that for a few years now. So I don't actually cold call or reach out to the clients. Clients are actually booked for us. It's more of a uh, one day call, call every single day. No, you know, no other opportunity than, than that day. Yep. So my main question was when you were, uh, 
when you were meeting with your clients with life insurance and, you know, you were connecting with people in their homes, I'm sure, or your office or whatever, um, what was the best way you found to, you know, people and kind of gain that, that credibility and trust? So, you know, with us, it was all about, um, you know, we're very, very narrowly niched. And so, you know, we serve a small demographic of people. And so we mm -hmm. built our systems around, like, we know them better than they know themselves. So we know exactly what to say, how to say it, how to carry ourselves, what to dress, you know, what to wear, what to, you know, hand them, like every facet of our business is designed yeah. specifically around those people. And so for, you know, to me, you know, that's like the, the ultimate form of respect because it gets them to the buying decision as quickly as possible because we're basically speaking their language. Um, but, you know, to provide some value to your question, you know, one of the things that I'm the biggest um, uh, proponent of is the close of saying, what did you want to start with? And so, you know, I don't mm -hmm. know if there's different levels or different, you know, price points okay. or, you know, different things with your product, but I'm assuming at some point they can make a change down the road, right? Like they could call and say, Hey, I know I signed up for this, but I'd rather do that kind of a thing. Yeah. I actually work in house where we upgrade and continue to build on their portfolio of their, what they own. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, with that, like I'm so big on the, the starting point because it's like the least path to, path to resistance. Like it's the easiest for someone to make a decision when they're, then when they think they're just starting, right? Like, Oh, I'm just, mm -hmm. I'm just starting. I can always change it later. Cause you know, the number one objection that you're going to hear is that either I need to talk to my spouse or I need to think about it. You know, I need, I, I need, I'm going to need to go home and, you know, talk to my wife about this. And so what I always do in those circumstances is, you know, I always agree with them. So I kind of confirm what they're saying. Like, you know, man, mm -hmm. I completely understand. I would have to talk about, I would have to talk to my wife about this decision too. But yeah, empathy statement. Yeah. And, and, you know, the majority of the people I've talked to this week said the exact same thing, but here's why they went ahead and, and signed up anyways. And so you're saying, like, found, hey, but, well, yeah, yeah. Like a bunch of people said this already this week, but here's why they went ahead and signed up. And using that, you know, whatever, you know, verbiage goes after that, but then the second that you get done with that verbiage, saying, so what do you want to start with? Like, I literally like shrug my shoulders and kind of just make it like it's not that big a deal. I'm like, so what do you want to start with? What do you want to start with, man? Right. And they're like, oh, you know, you know, people, you know, that old saying, you know, people um, love to buy, but they hate to be sold. Like, I don't want right. people to feel like they're being sold. Um, so I genuinely try to create a scenario where, you know, I, I come across as being completely indifferent. Like, I don't really care if they buy or not. And, you know, of course, yeah. when, you, when you've been doing it, you know what your conversions are or your close ratio. Like, I, I rely so heavily on my conversion ratio and close ratio that I just, I, I literally don't care if that person buys. I, I could care less. Right. And when you can be completely indifferent like that, they can feel that and sense that versus, you know, the opposite of when they think that, geez, like this guy's about to lose his house if I don't buy, <laughs> you know, like right, some absolutely. people call it like commission breath or whatever. Um, you know, there's, right. a, there's a big difference, but like when they genuinely feel like, you know, like you're not trying to put them into something that's not right for them. Like you're not trying to just make a commission. Uh, and sometimes that comes from, you know, giving them some options and not doing the, you know, typical, you know, good, better, best and kind of leaning towards the better, like start with the lowest. Like, Hey man, what do you want to start with? Right. You want to start with the, and then name off like the lowest possible package or the lowest possible right. you know product. And um, because it comes across as being genuine, like this guy didn't try to upsell me. This guy didn't try to, you know, put me in the most expensive thing. He actually started with the lowest. Um, and there's been times literally when, you know, I'm sitting down with someone with insurance and they're like, you know, I don't know, if, I don't know if I need, you know, 700,000 of coverage or, or 500,000 is enough. And I'll right. say to them, well, why don't you just start with 250,000? You can always call it and change it, call us and change it later. And they'll say, yeah, you're right. Let's do the 750. Because exactly. it's like in that moment, I prove that I don't, that I'm not trying to sell them. And so, you know, from there, from that point on, they were like, you know, okay, I'm, I'm good. Let's do the most. 
Um, but it's coming from a super genuine place. It's not like I'm trying to trick him into that. You know, it's coming from a genuine place because I don't care. Um, yeah, with me and what we do, it's uh, it's pretty fast paced and transactional. And so I'm just trying to get that process, get them to an answer, whether it's yes or no, as quickly as possible. Because I've got somebody mm -hmm. out there, you know, whether they're in the room or whether it's the next person I call or whether it's the next appointment, like somebody that is interested and is losing interest by the second. And so I'm just trying to get them, I'm just trying to have that process, you know, nailed down to where it's as efficient as humanly possible to get to an answer, not just efficient as humanly possible to get to a yes, because that could take forever. Um, right. Because it's enough, because you were saying, not, it's, uh, well, man, you just confirmed a lot of stuff. I train on a lot. And so that cool. was, that's really good. That's awesome to hear. Awesome, man. Where are you, where are you calling from? Where, where are you at? I'm in Oceanside, California right now. Oh, nice. Very good. All right, man. Well, have a good rest of your Tuesday. All right, man. You too. Appreciate right. the time. Yeah, man. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. All right. So uh, I'm going to answer this last question from Mark because uh, I've been thinking about it lately too. Um, so Gary V, uh, you know, keeps suggesting in all his, you know, keynotes and stuff about putting out 100 pieces of content a day. Well, Andy Fasella did a podcast recently where he just like tore him a new one. Um, he didn't say his name, but he said he had this whole podcast on the MFCO project about, um, you know, bad advice that people are being given and how ridiculous it is and, and the right advice. And he just, he's like, you know, there's people out there that are telling you to put 10,000 pieces of content out every single mother effing day. Uh, he started yelling, got angry as he does. Um, and uh, and so Mark said here, Andy Fussell has a different view on it. Uh, he said, what's your thoughts on using every platform and putting out that much content? I'm not putting out enough either way, but just curious on your thoughts on this. Um, you know, it's a lot of what Gary's talking about is hyperbole. Should you put out 100 pieces of content every day if you have the capability? Of course. But that's on top of doing all of the income producing activities that have to be done. Like that's on top of putting in the 10, 12, 14, 16 hours of work into the actual business and generating revenue and providing services and selling products and doing all the other things that are important uh, with, uh, with your business. And so I think the, the point to Gary's point is that the more content you're putting out, the better end of story. And that the reality is, especially with all these new updates going on with these different platforms, is that less and less people are seeing the stuff you're posting. And so if less and less people are seeing the stuff you're posting, and I got into kind of a, not an argument, but a disagreement in, in the comments of a girl here in Greenville, um, one of her posts, because she was talking about how that means the quality needs to improve. I think that's completely wrong. If less and less people are seeing your posts, it doesn't mean the quality needs to get better. It means you need to post more. If the quality just gets better, that means less and less people are going to see better and better quality stuff. It's still not going to be seen by more people. So the, of course the answer is and, like qu quality and quantity. But what's quality? It's so subjective to each individual person. The thing that I think is the best quality, someone else may think is the worst quality. And right down the road, line up a thousand people, they all, they'll all say completely polar opposite things about what you think is great quality versus not great quality. So it's all about just putting out more. And the reality is the people that, you know, Gary's telling to put out a hundred pieces of content and saying these things, which, you know, for him is a reality when he's got a team like that, for most people it's not. It's still, you know, the people that he's saying this to aren't putting out one post a day. The majority of people that are on here aren't putting one post a day. And by one post a day, I mean they put out 365 posts this year. Majority of people aren't doing that. Vast majority aren't doing two posts a day. I'm doing three to five a day every day, every single day. Does it need to be 10? Yes, 100% it needs to be 10. I've been thinking a lot about it lately that I need to start increasing it again. Because I used to do like seven or eight posts a day. But nobody remembers a bad post. So if you're looking at that post going like, ah, I don't know if I should post this, you should just post it. 
no one's gonna no one's sitting around with their friends or colleagues or no one's in a business meeting going hey did you see that uh you know did you see that facebook live tyler did uh last tuesday when nobody got on there and asked any questions for like the first 20 minutes and it was super awkward i don't care we still did it doesn't matter it really doesn't matter we were able to provide a few people on here some real value today by answering their questions and that was the whole intent on doing this um, so the fact that nobody got on here and put their phone number for the first 20 minutes for us to call them when we put 30 minutes of effort before this getting the phone service back up and running because we hadn't done this in forever is inconsequential it's just one more piece of content that'll go out which will get repurposed for an episode of the vlog on Thursday, which will get repurposed into tons of micro content for the Road to Legacy vlog for the next three months, which will get repurposed into tons of content that'll go into Instagram stories and, you know, LinkedIn posts and, you know, YouTube, you know, bumpers and like all kind, like all this stuff that gets created from us coming on here and having a seemingly in the beginning unsuccessful Facebook and Instagram live but was successful in the end because it was just the act of doing so is what, you know, we look at as a success. And so, you know, a hundred pieces of content, of course, it's ridiculous. Unless you have a team and the capability to do so, then you should hundred percent do it. And he's a lot of times talking to companies when he's saying that, that kind of stuff. He's, he's, he's saying it to individuals, but he's saying it to individuals that in his mind represent companies and businesses and brands. So does Pepsi need to be putting out a hundred pieces of content a day? Probably they need to be putting out, a thousand pieces of content a day if they want to do the things that you know they have the ambitions of doing does you know a small you know mom and pop store in greenville need to be putting out 100 pieces of content a day yes if they want to become a nationwide you know brand that has a thousand stores of course so i think it's you know it's important to kind of contextualize uh, what we're talking about but i'm glad you asked that because i was a uh, as i was listening to that mfco podcast with any for sale i was laughing because i was like oh man he's gonna he's gonna rip him and you know here's another cool statement so you know andy um andy's, andy for sale is a great guy and it's not just because i'm wearing this first form t-shirt that i'm saying that um you know he's someone that i met you know, early on, I met him and Gary Vaynerchuk um, before I started documenting my life on social media about two years, about a year and a half, two years prior, um, before I'd done anything on social media. I got to sit down with them in a conference room for three hours one night and just talk about anything and everything. And I've kept in touch since, you know, he's a guy that if I DM, he'll respond. And, and there was a time, you know, about a year and a half or so ago where he DM me and was like, hey, man, do you mind if I give you some honest feedback? And, you know, when a guy that has a company that this year will do 300 million asks you if he can provide you feedback, you obviously say yes. And, and so he told me I'm posting too much. And he said, man, you're just, you're posting so much. Like nobody has that much to say. Like you're, you're going to water it down and people aren't going to, you know, you're not going to get as much engagement and people aren't going to be, it's going to start becoming noise, you know, to people that are, you know, hopefully going to be following your, your content and engaging. And I disagreed with him. I completely disagreed. I was also at that time six months in to really starting my you know personal brand and and going all in on this stuff. And yeah, you know, I have a guy that's running a couple hundred million dollar business giving me this advice, so I couldn't really not take that advice. Um, so I, I slowed it down a little bit. Um, but to tell you right now, if if that's uh, correct or incorrect, it's completely incorrect as you're starting to build your brand. When you build your business up to the point where it has a million followers, when you build your social media platforms to where you have a million followers, two million followers, three million followers, then you can cut it back to like Andy, he'll do one post a day, one post every couple of days. And of course the engagement is through the roof on that post because it's the only thing that his followers, of which are millions, are waiting to see that content. When it comes out, it's a big deal. And so they engage, they comment, they share, they, you know, all the stuff. Well, when you have 3,000 followers and you're in the process of building your brand and Facebook and Instagram and all these platforms are throttling the reach of those posts, more is better, more is better, more is better. If you could post 100 times a day and you had the capability of doing that and continue the upper trajectory of your business, then you 1,000% should do that every single day. But if it's going to become at the detriment of your business, then no, of course you shouldn't do that. And so... And that's just kind of where I where I fall on that. But I love Andy. He's incredible. 
Uh, and he's real. And that's why I like him. That's why I like Gary as well, because he's real and uh, and raw. And they tell, you know, the whole story. And I love how Andy talks about the seven years where they never made like over five or six or 700 bucks a month and were sleeping on a pea stained mattress in the back of their supplement store. Like that's the kind of stuff people need to hear because all everybody else wants to tell you is how easy success is and how easy it is to build a business and how easy it is to become wealthy. And it's just not true. And uh, the ones that are out there telling that real story um, are the ones that are going to make an actual impact um, on this world. And I hope to be one of those. So uh, with that guys, we are going to wrap up this uh, live Q&A. Uh, we call this the discomfort zone, where we are embracing vulnerability one question at a time. For those of you that joined in live, for those of you that joined in on the um, replay, appreciate you. Uh, for those that had questions, appreciate you even more. And uh, for everybody else, we will see you next time. So just got done doing a uh, live Q&A. Um, how long do we do that for like an hour and a half, at least, at least an hour and a half. Um, and you know, it was something that kind of came up last minute and we threw it together. And in the very beginning, it was a little awkward because nobody jumped on there and nobody put their phone number for us to call them with questions. And, uh, you know what? Uh, I would love to say that that didn't feel awkward, but it did feel awkward. But at the end of the day, that's fine. That's completely fine because we said we were gonna go do a live Q&A. We did a live Q&A. We got on there for an hour and a half. We answered some people's real questions that they had. And, um, and that's awesome. Like that's what it's all about. And so um, super happy with it. Could it have gone better? Of course. But you know, could it have gone worse? Of course. And so I think that's probably the narrative, especially that last question, is that it's just putting your stuff out there. Um, do what you say you're gonna do and uh, do it to the best of your ability and good things will happen.